All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so the lecture for this unit is going to deal with what um, with what I like to call the enlightened revolutions. Uh, these are the revolutions, both political and social, in and around <coughs> in and around the um, Atlantic Ocean that kind of kicks off the early modern age. Okay. Oh, so in terms of the recommended viewing. Uh, the crash courses for this unit are kind of a must. Um, they're going to give you the detail on the political revolutions that we're not going to be able to really get into. Um, also, I recommend the AP Euro bit by bit with the isms. Um, this is going to cover a lot of the political uh, theories and the political movements that develop after the French Revolution, like conservatism, liberalism, nationalism. Um, it's also going to talk a little bit about um, romanticism, which develops as kind of a counter to the strict logic and the strict reason of uh, the Enlightenment. And then down at the bottom, uh, there is a series uh, by Tom Ritchie, who normally I don't recommend Tom Ritchie stuff because I think he's kind of arrogant and self-aggrandizing, but uh, this little five-part series that he does with women in the French Revolution and kind of the, uh, the cradle of early feminism is actually really, really good. Um, he talks about feminism and the implications of it um, with Marie Antoinette, with the Olympia de Gouge, Mary Wollstonecraft, as well as uh, some others. So if you're interested in getting a better look at the early birth of feminism in and around the French Revolution, then I would highly recommend that part. Now, we're going to start with the political revolutions, um, and we're just going to go chronologically. So um, we're not really ranking them from best to worst or worst to best here. Um, we're just going to take them as they come historically. So the first of these is uh, the American Revolution. And the American Revolution really is, um, it, it, it's fought over, over money. It's fought over taxation. Um, in the mid-1700s, the British kind of do an about face. They do a 180 on their policy towards their colonies in the Americas. And it's not just the 13 colonies, it's also their colonies in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Um, but after years of kind of, I don't wanna say neglect, but, hand, but after years and years of a hands-off approach, the British decide to begin um, taxing and somewhat micromanaging their colonies in the Americas. Um, they begin installing new taxes to pay for the Seven Years' War and their wars against France, and their wars in Europe, and their wars in the Indian Ocean. And basically, uh, this policy is what pushes the 13 colonies into revolt. Um, so if we're looking at causes um, <clears throat> of the American Revolution, um, number one is widespread knowledge of Enlightenment ideas. Um, books and pamphlets from France and from England, the ideas of guys like Locke and Rousseau and Montesquieu were pretty well known in uh, North America, especially in the British colonies. Again, because these colonies um, tend to have a higher rate of education and a higher rate of literacy than the Caribbean or the Central and the South American colonies. Um, also, like we just said, the increased taxes and the increased government control after the Seven Years' War um, is really kind of the spark that lights this powder keg. Um, also, the fact that the colonies are not represented in British Parliament is a um, source of contention between the colonial leaders and um, King George. Um, also as part of their change in policy towards uh, the towards the American colonies, the British began what's known as impressment. Um, this is essentially forcible drafting of American colonists into the British Army and the British Navy 
In some cases, the British would stop American ships and just simply, um, for better or worse, kidnap the most able-bodied members of the crew and, you know, basically enroll them in the British Navy right there on the spot and, and sail away. Um, also, as tensions between the two groups begin to heighten, um, the colonies in the Americas begin to form colonial militias to protect themselves and to protect their interests. And this causes the British to reinforce their army in the Americas. And um, on several occasions, they forcibly disarm the colonial militias, confiscating their guns, conf confiscating their gunpowder. Um, and this is actually the event that begins the Revolutionary War at Lexington and Concord, right? Now, we're not going to get into the details of the war itself, um, but after about six or is it six, let me do the math in my head. After about five and a half years of war, um, the colonial army uh, is victorious with lots and lots of French support. Um, and once the British surrender and they grant independence to the colonies, um, the founding fathers create a government inside the United States that embraces those enlightenment ideas that served as the inspiration. Um, and they build them into the framework of a social contract based on the ideas of John Locke. And this becomes known as the U.S. Constitution. Now, in terms of the revolutionary side of this revolution, politically, this is a massive revolution. You have the independence of the 13 colonies. You have the rejection of British monarchy in the Americas. You have the first democratic republic in the Americas. You have the first democratic republic in, oh, I don't know, 1800 years or so. Um, so politically, this is a massive revolution. Economically, it has lots of, uh, it, it, it has a massive impact because mercantilism has now been broken in the 13 colonies. Um, colonial merchants are now free to trade with whomever they want um, at their own market prices. Um, they're not required to ship goods on British, um, on British merchant ships, meaning that the taxes are now much, much lower. Um, however, in one area where it's not very revolutionary is daily social life. Um, slavery is still very widespread in the 13 colonies. Women receive minimal increase in their social status. They don't receive the right to vote or own property or anything like that. Um, the political life remains mainly the same as before the revolution. Um, before the revolution, who is in charge? Rich white landowning men. After the revolution, who's in charge? Rich, white, landowning men. They just don't answer to a king in England anymore. Now they're self-governed. Um, there's also very little redistribution of wealth. Um, very little land is seized in the Americas. Um, there are some large estates of uh, British loyalists who had fled the country that are seized and they become government land. In some cases, they're redistributed, but very, very rarely. Um, so if we're looking for the major impact of the American Revolution, uh, probably in, you know, in reality, the biggest impact of the American Revolution is going to be the inspiration that it provides to other revolutions. Um, the American Revolution is seen as proof that validates the Enlightenment, right? I mean, you got to remember this is this is still the time frame of the scientific revolution and empiricism and the scientific method, right? Our ability to understand the world and life around us is based on data. It's based on empirical evidence. It's based on um, experimentation and proving the validity of one's theory. The American Revolution is seen by many people as empirical proof that those Enlightenment ideas are correct, that 
the ideas of equality, of social justice, of, you know, um, of democratic government, of uh, power of the people. The American Revolution, to many, seems to prove that. And it's understandable why they would think that, because if you look at the American Revolution, we should have lost. We should have lost badly. Um, the American Revolution should have failed numerous, numerous, numerous times. Okay, it, there's no way it should have it, that it should have succeeded. You had a, you had small, very poorly funded colonies. Okay, with a tiny population that is facing off against the largest, most experienced, wealthiest military force in the world, and. On numerous occasions, the British Army should have crushed the American Revolution. Um, George Washington, if you look at the American Revolution from strictly a military standpoint, was terrible. Washington was a terrible commander in chief. In fact, Washington had always been kind of a terrible general. Um, he had made it to the rank of the of lieutenant in the British Army before they released him because. He got too many of his men killed. Um, so, I mean, he was a poor choice and he did a poor job, especially in the first three years of the revolution. I mean, he almost lost the entire revolution in the first three months when he tried to um, defend the island of Manhattan and was almost surrounded on both sides by the British Navy and a British army marching down from Canada. Um, militarily, the 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 revolution was actually won by his subordinate generals and support from the French, um, the Marquis de Lafayette, who came over from France to help train Washington and the army. Um, Southern generals like Nathaniel Greene, um, they're the ones who actually won the fight. Um, Washington's best quality was that he could pick good subordinates. So, at the end of the day. The question really that you're faced with here is, well, how in the hell did this succeed? How did 13 poorly funded, rather tiny colonies in terms of population defeat the largest, wealthiest, most experienced military force on the planet? And for a lot of people, the only explanation that is plausible for this is that the Americas had triumphed because they were in accordance with natural law in the same way that gravity is a natural law or the momentum, the second law of motion is a natural law. So the way that people see this is that the American Revolution succeeded because it was part of the natural universe that they would succeed, that democratic institutions will always succeed against monarchy and tyranny and despotism because that is the natural order of things that is the way that the universe wants it to be and that for all of human history up to this point we have been you know um going against the natural order of the universe and so over the next 60 years, the American Revolution is basically going to become the model <clears throat> for how a smaller, weaker force can overthrow and gain independence from a larger, much wealthier force. Um, and it's going to provide this inspiration that as long as you are fighting for the ideals of democracy, equality, liberty, et cetera, that you will always succeed. And you're going to see a lot of this mentality later on in the French Revolution, where even when the French Revolution becomes exceedingly radical and war has broken out and citizens are being arrested and guillotined by the thousands, the leaders of the French Revolution still see themselves in the right even though they've turned against a lot of the ideals that they proclaim for themselves, they 
continue to follow that path because in their mind, the American Revolution has proved that this is the natural order of things, that revolution and equality and liberty must be preserved at any cost.